This afternoon we'll be starting a mini-series on the office of a deacon. <clears throat> My role this afternoon is to cover the qualifications of a deacon. Then on Wednesday night, Nathan will cover uh, what is a deacon. And then next Sunday afternoon, Trevor, Trevor will cover the role of a deacon. So that's what we, we have in store. Uh, Mark, would you turn to Acts chapter 6? I'll ask you to read that in a minute. To understand the office of a deacon, we need to carefully consider how the Spirit guided the church to take care of the needy beginning in Acts chapter 6. In Acts 2 through 5, we see the church is it's growing. And I don't think you can read the book of Acts and not be excited because the church is it's flourishing. Everywhere we go, thousands of people are being baptized. The gospel's being spread. The Christians are taking care of one another. Uh, they're taking care of those who don't have anything. People are selling their possessions. And it continues to grow. It's joyful time for the church. But usually whenever there's explosive growth like that, you have growing pains. And one day that joy was not there as it should have been, and complaints were heard in the rapidly growing church of the Lord. And it's noteworthy that before we read Acts chapter 6, Acts 6 does not call these brothers deacons. It doesn't say the word deacons, which is the main reason there have been questions about whether they were really deacons. But the description of their task is a description of the work that a deacon is to do. <clears throat> the Greek dictionary defines deacon as a servant. And it underscores personal service rendered to another, usually with humility. Uh, there's a few other definitions I'm going to read here. We, um, we studied through the book, The Deacon by Cornelius Van Dam. And uh, his rendering of that is, deacons are those charged with the ministry of mercy to show the love of Christ by providing for the poor and the afflicted. Also another I read, the biblical role of deacons is to take care of the physical and logistical needs of the church so that the elders can concentrate on their primary calling. And if you'd like to go ahead and read Acts chapter 6 for us, Mark 1 through 6. <clears throat> In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God to serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they prayed, they laid their hands on them. Thank you. So it's brought to the apostles' attention that the Greek-speaking widows, and that's Jews who were born and raised in another country than Palestine. These women, these Hellenists, these widows were being neglected. And whether this was purposeful or not, we do not know. Sometimes these things are missed. Sometimes they're overlooked. But we can imagine how this grievance, how this grievance concerned everyone, the whole community of believers. Because whenever you, whenever you have a, a group of people that, that say, hey, come be a part of us, and then you don't take care of this little group just because they're a little different. That's weird, isn't it? And that's not, any, that's not what a, a Christian is. But we see that there, there was, of course, a language, maybe a cultural differences uh, there that, that might have played a role. But it's hard to continue to grow if there's murmuring. Church doesn't grow when there's murmuring. So what did the apostles do? Their solution was, brethren... Seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. The apostles asked the church to seek out from among them seven men. Now, I want to emphasize that the apostles did not choose these men. They told the church to choose these men. Men among them that they knew, men of good reputation, and they were full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom who could take care of the widows who were being neglected. <clears throat> so 
we find a few things in here that we might need to give definitions to. Good reputation is what they ask for. Honest men, men of integrity. That's who you were to look for. Men that were full of the Holy Spirit, and this is not a reference to miraculous spiritual gifts. If we're asked to select men full of the Holy Ghost today, what would we look for? We would look for men whose lives demonstrate the fruits of the Spirit, I would think. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. A man can be recognized for what he really is by observing what his life produces. So we know people by the fruit that they produce. And this is the kind of men that the church was asked to seek out. And when these men were appointed and the needs that were being neglected were met, the church continues to flourish. If you look down at Acts chapter 6, verse 7, it says, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now let's focus our attention on the only passage that mentions the qualifications of the deacon, and that is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Will you read that for us, John? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Beginning with verse 8, Likewise deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let those also let these also first be tested, and then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be brave, not slanderous, tempered, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Thank you. Now what we see in the qualifications listed uh, for deacons, they're really just like elders must be as far as a man is concerned. They have to bring credit to the church and to the local congregation. That's who we're looking for. They're servants of the Lord's church. They must maintain the purity of their Christian character and they must be men who are spiritual and not carnal because it's a job. It's a servant. That's not an easy job. But that's the job that they're to do. So let's look at these terms. It says the men it must be reverent. The deacon must be honorable and worthy of respect. One who maintains moral ethics and serves with dignity. I believe those are words that we understand. Worthy of respect. Not because he pushes his way around or he is just stronger than you are, or stronger willed than you are, but a person that you can respect for how he lives and what he does. Secondly, he's not supposed to be double-tongued. He must be sincere. And he must not speak out of both sides of his mouth. That's how I always uh, heard it. You, you don't say one thing in one house and say something different in another house just to, to, get, to gain uh, favor with that other person. And it would be hurtful to the church if the deacon was that way. If he was, if he was the person that spoke out of both sides of his mouth. Since a deacon can be intimately involved in people's lives it's imperative that his speech is free of gossip and it's free of lies because it's a position in which you are helping people whenever they are vulnerable They're vulnerable so you really have to take care of them you have to watch what you say he must in all circumstances control his tongue thirdly not given to much wine he's not addicted to wine he's a man of uh, of self-control is what he is and that's He's also not greedy for money. Uh, this is important. As we saw in Acts, these men were given the means to take care of the widows. What does that mean? Somebody gave them, somebody had them give them money or something to, to take care to get the food that these people needed. Or whether they distributed coin or however they were doing it. They were entrusted with money to get the job done. They had to manage and distribute food or money to help with daily needs. And this is not work for a dishonest or a greedy man. One who uh, steals and cheats will only harm the church. So you're looking for somebody that's not greedy. Another thing the Bible said is holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. Pure conscience. Boy, my mouth's not working. 
Uh, I like the New English Bible rendering there. It says, they must be men who combine a clear conscience with a firm hold on the deep truths of our faith. They're to know what they believe. And they're to live that out every day. The Bible says, let these also first be tested. A deacon will not be a new convert. He's not going to be somebody that just came out of the water and we put them to work whenever they're dripping wet. He must have the qualifications listed and be of sufficient age that would allow him um, allow time for a congregation to realize his loyalty, his steadfastness in the work of God. The congregation must agree that the candidate is serious-minded, trustworthy, and that he's sound in faith. These are, these are men that the congregation trust. Being found blameless is another qualification. And the word blameless here is unaccused, and it's a legal term. This qualification would not mean that they had never done anything wrong because if that was the case, then nobody could ever be that kind of servant. But presently, there's nothing against him. But then we go further. It says, likewise, their wives must be reverent. Because I know sometimes our ladies feel like you don't have a job to do. But as the, the wife of a deacon, you have a job to do. And it sounds big <laughs> whenever you read through there. But it says, likewise, the wise must be reverent. They, they too must be honorable and worthy of respect. They can't be slanderers because of the nature of the deacon's work. Their wives must not be malicious talkers. They must be careful not to gossip. They must be temperate. That's what the Bible says. That's well balanced having themselves under control in moral and spiritual issues, faithful in all things is another requirement. This expression means trustworthy. The great lesson here is that the wives of deacons can help their husbands in the church by being always discreet and diligent. And then the Bible says, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children well in their own house as well. A deacon is a, is a one-woman man, and that's his wife. He should rule his own house well. If their home is in spiritual disarray, how in the world are they going to be able to assist the church if your home's in chaos at all times? And when we consider the qualifications and the type of work that a deacon is to do, we can understand why these stip stipulations are included for his wife. Deacons are entrusted with caring for the congregation, and that includes male or female. Widows, widowers, the poor, the sick, the ill. The wife of a deacon would assist her husband in his work, especially when helping uh, one, of our, one of our women. One of our ladies, there are things that a, a man cannot do to help a lady. It just, it's not possible. I guess it would be possible if you wore a blindfold, but it's just not possible. It is therefore imperative that she be dignified, not a gossip, sober-minded, and faithful in all things. And it is striking that Scripture highlights the spiritual qualifications needed for the office of a deacon. In today's society, criteria such as uh, education or, or innovation or how energetic someone is, is the image that we're looking for. But God's Word directs us to look for wisdom in, in, a, in a practical sense and uh, management of life, of home, uh, maturity in the faith, integrity in all dealings good public reputation and a selfless commitment to service. That's what the Bible asks for in a deacon because he is a servant. And we can open this up for a question and answer because that was these are going to be short lessons because there's not a lot of material there. But uh, we can do Q&A if, if anybody has anything to, has a question or had something to add that I might need to highlight a little bit more. Yes, sir. In around 1924, the, the way that people evaluated um, success was based on where it used to be on character, it moved to more of a, an appearance base. And that's how it's progressed over the years. And what the scriptures is talking about is more character-based behaviors. It's not, not appearance, mm -hmm. it's more character-based. 
appearance is important, but character is the basis for it. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Nathan. In studying this, or is it, <coughs> excuse me. Um, is there any reason that a real order could, could not be in Nathan, or I mean, you run across anything like that? I. It kind of went both ways whenever you're going through it, because that was one of the questions I had, and I'm, I'm not firm on an answer yet. Uh, he's asking if a widower could be a deacon. Um, and from what I read, uh, you know, both trains of thought, I don't know what to settle on there. That's something I have to put more time in studying. If anybody else would like to... Yes. We might have a question for you or, or any brother that may have an answer, but in the readings of this passage in Acts chapter 6, is there any significance to the number of seven? And is that any in a way binding upon you need seven men to serve the station? I, I don't believe it is. I just, the number seven comes up a whole lot. Um, and that's, that was my only thought whenever I came to that number. I don't think you'd need seven deacons. I think you'd definitely need more than one to do the work because uh, there's a lot to do. Um, but nothing beyond that. Can you just remind us which of the qualifications, I'm not sure I remember, are not in the deacons list that are in the elders list? Do you have that? I, I don't. I can. We can go to... What, First Timothy? I think it's able to teach and faithful children. And I thought they would know. I thought maybe one of Yeah, I know able to teach is on the elders list. I mean, a deacon doesn't have to be able to stand up in a pulpit and teach. Uh, he, Based on his maturity, of course, he, would, he should be able to sit and study with someone or you know, give them answers that they need, lead someone to obey the gospel. Uh, because it, we look at it like uh, like his work is always physical, but there's a lot of spiritual needs that need to be taken care of. And so he needs to be a man of the word to understand it and able to, to teach it to people in a private setting at least. Well, thank you. I hope it was helpful. Thanks for taking it easy on me.